Enjoy. My guest today is Tony Mancy, a clinical exercise physiologist from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Tony is an expert in cardiovascular physiology, pathophysiology, and pharmacology. With 13 years of experience, which includes working with professional sports teams like the NBA's Milwaukee Bucks, as well as testing and educating many, many cardiac patients. Tony, thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate you uh, inviting me to do this podcast. I look forward to it. Fantastic. Well, it's, uh, it's the NBA preseason, so a great time to dive into this topic of heart health, cardiovascular screening, uh, as well as the, the athlete heart. And you know, for me, I'll tell you, the first time I heard about this was probably about 30 years ago. Um, a young kid playing and watching basketball, I, I distinctly remember, um, you know, Loyola Marymount, they're running gun style of basketball, and that visual of Hank Gathers, who, for those who are yes. really too young, the All-American basketball player, you know, destined for the pros, all of a sudden collapsing on court. Um, you know, tragically, he died shortly thereafter. And of course, the medical examiner found that he suffered from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That so, is correct. So, Tony, can you get listeners on the same page here and define... Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for us and who that might be impacting? Well, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a, um, can be acquired um, genetically, it can be, and that's usually the, the case, and it involves um, abnormal, abnormal functioning of the, the left ventricle, basically. Um, it thickens, and the septum, which is the uh, tissue between the right and left ventricle, that usually gets enlarged. And if it gets t uh, too enlarged, it can inhibit blood flow from the left ventricle up through the aortic uh, valve. And histologically, if you look at um, a person that's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their cell alignment is going to uh, going to be in disarray as opposed to a parallel um, arrangement. Interesting. And yeah, these these changes are precursors for um, sudden cardiac death. And basically, um, it expresses itself through tachyarrhythmias. A uh, person goes into V-fib, and if they're not defibrillated right away, it's you know a terminal event. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, obviously, really scary stuff, tragic, um, really emotional events as well. And, of course, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I didn't realize, was the single most common cause of uh, athletic field deaths, accounting for about a third of those deaths. Um, and although it is. Know, sudden cardiac death is still the most frequent medical cause, sort of the umbrella term, and it's about, you know, still only, what, 1 in 40 40,000 to 80,000, so, so not very many, but still obviously very emotional. And I think a lot of listeners are wondering, you know, left ventricle hypertrophy is what happens when you train and get fitter. Um, sure. So, so what's this difference between the athlete's heart and heart disease? Um, you mentioned a little bit there around from a cellular standpoint. Is there anything else? Um, a normal um, normal heart, when you, when you train as an athlete, certain adaptations take place. The myocardium or the... Um, Ventricular walls thicken. Uh, this creates an inotropic effect, meaning that the left ventricle has the ability to contract harder. Now, there's a principle called the Frank Starling principle. Um, is a physiological principle, and if the um, myocardium gets stretched, because not only do the um, does the myocardium get, get thicker, but the cavity enlarges. And if, it's, if it goes beyond a certain optimal uh, cavity size, then actually the contractility will go down. And that's a principle of the Frank Starling uh, effect. Um, so normal uh, athletic heart, uh, you're going to see these changes. I think one of the distinct differences is what they call abnormal diastolic uh, filling meaning when the heart's at rest and it's being uh, supplied by the atrium uh, with blood, in a diseased heart, it gets stiff. The ventricle becomes stiff and gotcha. um, it will not accept the proper amount of blood. Whereas in an athletic heart, 
you don't have those changes. And that's one of the major distinctions. That and you don't have the septal um, hypertrophy as, as much. Yeah, it's really um, you know fascinating stuff. And definitely when you start to go through the list of athletes um, you know, who've unfortunately succumbed to this, you know, Joe Kennedy, 28 year old pitcher for the Blue Jays, and right. Ryan Shea, U.S. marathon runner, Damian Nash, Denver Broncos running back, Jason Collier, Atlanta Hawks center, Thomas mm-hmm. Harrion, San Francisco 49ers offensive lineman, Sergei Zaltok played in the NHL, Miklos Fair, a Hungarian soccer pro. I mean, you know, there's, there's far more people on here than we would think. Um, and, and those are the high, those are the high profile cases, you know, exactly. one thing I want to mention, uh, Mark is that, um, it's common, it's more common in, in males. It's more common in African American males. And, um, surprisingly it's more common in men's basketball and soccer. Interesting. Yeah. That's the epidemiology behind it. Yeah, it was good. It was dovetailing into my next question because around sex differences, I noticed that in highly trained females, you know, it rarely showed any kind of absolute left ventricle wall thickness. And you know, a recent study showing that 600 elite female athletes and none of them had this, whereas, um, you know, in that especially that gray area of 13 to 15 millimeters. And, uh, right. and you mentioned obviously men, and of course, um, you know, basketball, soccer. Um, is there anything in particular in, in those sport, sports besides? Uh, ethnicity background that might be predisposing you know that's a good question i i don't know the exact answer to that i just know that epidemiologically that's what um seems to be uh the the most common in these types of athletes and there are others i've noticed some other sports as well we said you know rowing and cycling obviously you know very aerobic sports commonly associated with the you know increased left ventricular wall thickness um, right, but surprisingly, a lot of the power sports, weightlifting, wrestling, are not. Uh, they don't see these increases above you know twelve to thirteen millimeters. No, it's you'd, you'd think so, but um, that's not the case. You know, there's other other etiologies. Um, the most common is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then the subset of that is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where you have that intraventricular septum really kind of inhibiting blood flow. Um, beyond that, the second leading cause is anomalous cord, coronary arteries, where the normal cordia, coronary arteries, um, maybe there's a deviation from the origin. They could have abnormal shape or size, and this can lead to myocardial ischemia and then eventually tachyarrhythmias. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's a list of things that we won't get into, but um, like you've heard of Marfan syndrome. Yep. That's, that can be a cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard of it. You know, it's an inheritive connective tissue disorder. It usually affects the aorta and the aorta becomes aneurysmal or it dissects. And then you've got a terminal event. Yeah. It's uh, again, fascinating, fascinating stuff. And for someone like yourself, a clinical physiologist, if we, you know, continue to look at this from a sports lens to, to start with here, you know, what would a preseason, whether it's NBA protocol or even another sport look like in, in general, in terms of, you know, the tests that you might run and, and, and what those sure. tests are looking for. Well, specifically with the Milwaukee Bucks, which I've been working with for the last 13 years, um, we're talking about it. These, these guys are elite athletes and we're, we use, um, this is NBA protocol. Um, they dictate what, what what happens in terms of testing. And the first thing that happens is each player gets a resting transthoracic echocardiogram. And what that does, it, it defines the, the integrity of the heart, the size of the heart, the chamber size, the wall thickness, all four valves, whether they're functioning properly. Um, and that's that's the basis of... A trans thoracic echo. Gotcha. Beyond that, do you have any questions about that, Mark? Oh, just for the uh, listeners there. So, in terms of establishing baselines, is that sort of compared year to year for the for the players? And- right now, the NBA requires this uh, testing every single year, and um, and it's, in my opinion, it's a little overkill. But you know, you've got an athlete that's 
getting paid millions and millions of dollars and they want to protect their investment. So they can do a baseline and they can compare longitudinally whether or not they're, they're you know, for example, the echo, if they're having any significant structural abnormalities that may, you know, come to fruition. Yeah. And what type of abnormalities might you pick up on a, on a test like that? Well, like we talked about, abnormal uh, thickening of the septum, you might pick up some um, some valve disorders like mitral valve regurgitation, or a, a big one would be aortic stenosis. Um, that can be really debilitating. So we look for those type of things. And then um, beyond that, they're required to take a exercise tolerance test with imaging, and that's called a stress echocardiogram. Mm-hmm. And they uh, get on a treadmill, or, and we have a have them do a, a treadmill test according to the Bruce protocol, which every three minutes we increase the speed and the grade, and we monitor continuously their their heart rate, blood pressure, and we look at um, first of all. Before they even get on the treadmill, they do a, a resting echo of, of the left side of the heart only, and they do it in several different views. And it looks at the we're looking at the contractility of the heart. If you've got uh, any issues with the blood supply to the heart, the heart's not going to be contracting properly, and that shows up at rest and at peak exercise. So an athlete will get on the treadmill and. Gradually, every three minutes, we increase the speed and the grade, and we want to get that, according to NBA protocol, their heart rate has to be above 85, and they like more towards 95%. At that point, when we hit that uh, parameter, there's an abrupt stop. They lay back down in bed, and there's an echo person right next to the bed that does the, the resting echo and also this peak echo. It's a sudden stop. They, they image the, the heart at peak exercise, and they can look at the wall motion, and they can, they can determine whether or not there's any abnormalities in the contractility of the heart. So those are the two big, um, the resting echo and the stress echocardiogram that um, we can look at and see if there's any, uh, you know, abnormal wall motion or any structural integrity problems. Terrific, and it? You know, are there certain arrhythmias, uh, Tony, that uh, just require sort of monitoring uh, by the medical staff versus, uh, again, you mentioned the stenosis previously, things that might jump out where the, the player might need uh, um, to be referred for more and more medical testing? Well, what we're looking for, again, would be um, tachyarrhythmias. Now, most people, when you get them on a treadmill and you're monitoring, they might have premature beats, atrial premature beats. That's totally normal. You know, you're, you're secreting more catecholamine when you start to exercise and makes the myocardium more irritable. Um, but we're looking for, especially when they're exercising, does their blood pressure go up on a linear basis, the systolic blood pressure? Because the normal response would be with increasing workloads, your systolic blood pressure goes up. Uh, your diastolic stays about the same and there's plus or minus standard deviation, maybe 10 beats a minute. So that's the, that's one of the parameters we look at, um, along with the contractility of the heart. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we've definitely covered here the, you know, the athlete heart hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and how a medical staff, you know, for a professional team or collegiate team would be screening for this. Sure. Uh, but maybe we can zoom out here a little and talk about how, you know, exercise is indeed obviously one of the most powerful tools for improving heart health. Um, it's been associated with beneficial changes in most cardiovascular risk factors, right? Like, uh, including lipids, things like blood pressure, insulin sensitivity, uh, weight management. So can you maybe talk to listeners now about, you know, just the normal and positive adaptations to aerobic training? Well, sure. Centrally, meaning in the heart, you know, the heart cavity enlarges, um, and that allows for greater, uh, filling capacity and that, would increase your stroke volume. Um, and by definition, heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output, the amount of blood that's circulating at any given workload. So if you can increase the chamber size, increase stroke volume, 
then you know what happens is you a trained athlete their heart rate will decrease um, because you've got this you know cavity enlargement um, but you're still maintaining maintaining the same cardiac output that's one of the one of the uh, things that happen on the periphery uh, meaning in your in your tissues with aerobic training you develop um, more mitochondria, mitochondrial density goes up, as well as the capillary density. So your ability to extract oxygen is increased, and that increases your VO2 max, a measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. Yeah, so important for you know athletes, obviously, to have a baseline level of aerobic fitness, no matter what the sport, and of course, uh, general populations as well, especially today with sedentary living being just sort of the norm and people not getting enough movement. Right. Um, and of course, too many it, people, excuse me, Mark, I just wanted to interject here. Yeah, for sure. I see, I, I see more and more of it. It's, it's kind of sad. You, you see these, um, younger people that are developing type two diabetes at a younger age, obesity at a younger age. And when I was growing up, you know, my brothers and I were always active out playing, you know, now, unfortunately, People are on computers, they're playing video games, they eat at fast food places, and obesity is an epidemic. 70% of um, uh, the, the population in the U.S. is considered obese. Yeah, it is um, it is amazing how in the last four decades things have changed so dramatically. In the U.K. this year, in London, they had um, one of the hottest summers on record for the last 40 or 50 years. and I think that they had a picture of a beach, I think it was in the 1970s, um, to show the last, you know, recorded, um, you know, very warm, hot summer, and it was amazing because when you looked at the population, it was a shot of hundreds of people on a beach, and you, it was difficult to find an overweight or obese person. You sort of had to look really closely, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how four decades later, you know, that same photo is just a total, totally different um, image, and and like you yeah. mentioned, just the environment around us, the food we're eating, uh, lack of movement. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, no surprise, coronary artery disease, you know, leading cause of mortality worldwide. And exactly. Course, you know, a bit like you mentioned before, there's some non-modifiable risk factors like age and genetics that can obviously increase risk. But what about some of the modifiable risk factors, the ones that people sure, can do sure. something about? Can you list off a few of those? Well, some of the modifiable risk factors would be um, your blood lipids, for example. With, you, with, with exercise, you can actually increase your HDL. That is the... Uh, good cholesterol, it takes cholesterol from your uh, arteries and arterioles and bloodstream and brings them back to your liver. Um, it takes the LDL back to your, to your liver to get metabolized. So you can affect your blood lipid profile with uh, exercise. You can obviously uh, affect a little bit of your obesity, although I always say you can never out-exercise a bad diet. With the exception, if you're like a ultra marathon or something like that, you can you can eat six thousand calories a day and you'll burn it all up. But for the average individual, exercise, in my opinion, is good for weight maintenance, but it is not really good for weight loss. For um, sure. Yep. The other um, big one would be smoking. I mean, that's a definite no-no for obviously for cardiovascular risk and pulmonary risk and cancer. So you, um, you know, lack of, excuse me, uh, lack of physical activity along with uh, not controlling stress in your life. That's a big factor as well. Um, you need to take time to either meditate, you know, read, whatever it takes to try to calm yourself down, uh, center yourself so that you're not um, so stressed out. And today that's sometimes easier said than done. And you had mentioned some non-modifiable risk factors. You obviously can't change your age, your genetics, but you're born within a specific genetic profile, and you've got these other modifiable risk factors that you can either you know you can manage them, and you can change the outcome of um, you know the disease process if you're um, doing the right things. And Tony, for yourself in clinical practice, working in the general population, what are some of the things that you would see? you know, in assessing heart health with patients? Sure. Well, we look, uh, we look at um, what I call the index of suspicion. 
you know, somebody, you know, who's coming in and they're younger, they don't have a family history. Um, so their index of suspicion is pretty low, but they're having maybe some atypical symptoms, atypical angina, which means they're having maybe angina at rest and not uh, with increasing workloads. We'll do an exercise tolerance test, um, a Bruce protocol test on these individuals, monitor their their heart rate, continuous EKG, blood pressure, those type of things, but without imaging. Now, if you get somebody that's has a different risk factor profile, then there's a myriad of different tests, imaging tests that we can use to determine whether or not these people in actuality have um, coronary disease. One of the tests would be the stress echo um, that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. A person that's got compromised coronaries you may not see it at rest, and that's why we kind of do a resting echo first, and then we get them on the treadmill. But at peak exercise, when uh, you've got a uh, imbalance in coronary supply and uh, coronary supply versus demand, you've you've got a situation where it creates ischemia, and what will happen is the left ventricle will not be contracting robustly like it should. Um, some other testing that we do, and unfortunately nowadays, um, because of the obesity epidemic, um, in our clinic we've bought a PET scanner, and that kind of can, if you've got somebody that's remarkably obese, we can put them in the PET scanner, give them a radioactive uh, isotope that travels to the heart, and it will not travel to areas that have uh, stenotic or closed areas, and we can look at that and determine whether or not the person's got coronary disease. And the next step after that would be, if, if it comes out positive, then we take them to the cath lab and do an angiogram, which, you know, you don't want to take an angiogram as invasive, um, it's expensive, so we do this other testing ahead of time. If it becomes a situation where it looks positive, then we, the next step would be the angiogram. And if we find that they're, they have significant lesions, meaning a lesion that's 70% more in a, one of the major coronary arteries, then they will angioplasty that segment and then do place an intercoronary stent. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely um, amazing what we can do from a, you know, technology and and. and and procedure standpoint um on the other side of the spectrum you know unfortunate that it, it sort of gets to that point and f for yourself working with with patients and clients you know what are some of the things that you try to reinforce to help people you know get their heart health back on track well obviously you want to stress um get out there and and, and be active um if you're a smoker quit smoking um you're the diet expert, but I, I always, you know, I lean towards the Mediterranean diet, which is, you know, a, a diet that um, limits your red meat intake, um, kind of stresses um, plant-based foods, you know, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, um, replacing bad fats with, you know, which are or the saturated fats with olive oil, canola oil, um, and then eating fish and poultry at least twice a week. So, and again, you're the expert in nutrition. I, but when I when when patients ask me, that's kind of what I, I direct them to. One thing I, I want to backtrack, to sure, you, yeah. uh, Mark. Too, we were talking about sudden cardiac death, and I think this is really important. And I see it more and more in like gyms, in like other arenas where. Um, you're seeing defibrillators, automatic uh, defibrillators that are standard operating procedure because one of the first things you, you need to do if somebody goes into a cardiac arrest is put one of those defibrillators on them. It'll automatically determine whether they need to be shocked. And if so, it'll shock them back and in, hopefully into a normal, what they call sinus rhythm. Yep. It detects whether or not they're in VTAC or VFib ventricular fibrillation, which is um, can 
you know, go down the path of asystole and, and, and death. So it's really important, and I see a lot more of it in public places where they have automatic defibrillators available for people. And it's minimal training to use it. Yeah, no, great points. And definitely uh, for people who have facilities, gyms, et cetera, you know, definitely familiarize yourself with that and also check the batteries as well. I mean, I know that's another one that can creep up on people and they're not being sort of replaced. And the beauty of those devices, as you mentioned, is just they're very straightforward in terms of uh, being able to operate them. I mean, really um, leading you through the different steps, which is which is terrific. And, you know, you'd mentioned diet and obviously um you know, hugely important. And there's a recent study here in, in Europe showing that, you know, the processed food intake uh, in the UK, mm-hmm. in terms of the percentage of household income, was about 50% of all the food. And when you went down to places like France, you were down to like 15%. And when you were in Italy, mm-hmm. it was 12%. In Spain, it was 16%. So it was amazing how for folks just getting away, and of course, all those places have much better. Um, heart health uh, outcomes, yeah, population, the outcomes right? i'm sure a lot better um, yeah. so it's amazing i just yeah getting back to real food is, is a phenomenal first step to go um on the exercise side of things obviously building an aerobic base is a good place to start if people are are unfit just as you mentioned getting out getting active um and you want to make sure if you're starting an exercise program mark that um if you're new to it you want to make sure that you go to your primary care physician get clearance and what you want to do is start out uh, slowly and do it progressively. You don't want to hit the gym and go 90 miles an hour right away. You want to do this as a slow, progressive increment. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to dive tail into my uh, question around. You know, do you have any protocols or suggestions on how people can can start out or or progress their aerobic uh, training to to get themselves back? Uh, well, the American fitness. Heart Association and the World uh, Health Organization. They're recommending adults 18 to 64 um, exercise at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. Or they they say you can um, do the same thing but change the intensity and then you can decrease the, the minutes to 75. And then along with that, they want you to um, – and of course, the, those involve the major muscle groups when you're doing aerobic training. And they're for also sure. saying resistance training is important. That's important for maintaining healthy bones, especially for women postmenopausal, um, and just maintaining functional capacity capacity as you get older. Um, uh, those are some some of the recommendations by the big organizations. And um, I think you've had podcasts on HIT training in the past, and yeah, that's, Martin Gabala. Yep, he's the he's the Martin Gabala Gabala et al. are the experts in that area, and that's a proven um, entity. Uh, they've done a lot of research on it. It's high intensity interval training where you can condense your workout uh, from you know you see people in the gym working out for an hour hour and a half. Well, a lot of people don't have that the time to do that. And if you uh, follow uh, these protocols where you, for example, in my own experience, I'll get on a stationary bike, I'll ride at a moderate intensity for a couple of minutes, get off the saddle and go to like almost 100 percent, you know, capacity for about um, 45 seconds and then sit back down on the saddle, have an active recovery and go through that cycle for about 15 minutes and they've, they've shown that that type of exercise pattern can really affect um, your VO2 max and also caloric uh, expenditure. Yeah, that's great advice. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, time effective, which is terrific. And I was blown away by some of uh, the notes in, in Martin's research around just even cardiac rehab in terms of the safety. Now, obviously, people want to get some some support from their um their medical team but that's that's really um amazing as well to see that the 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 improvements that one can make from a recovery standpoint are also sure really proven well another thing i want to dovetail into is okay as you're in your everyday life i mean i've worked at an institution i work on the eighth floor i've never taken the elevators i always i don't recommend this for everybody but i sprint up every morning now, instead of taking the elevators for the average person, start using the stairwell. You know, and, um, you don't necessarily have to sprint like I do, but 
Use the stairwell. When you park in a parking lot, don't park real close to the building. Park away. You know, so you can do these things, not passively, but make them part of your lifestyle um, and then gradually build up your, your functional capacity. Yeah, it's such a great suggestion. I mean, definitely parking further away, too. That's where all the open spots are. So that's definitely a great one. Um, and I'm always amazed, too. I mean, when we talk about environment for food, it's it's a little bit the same with um, with activity and movement because, you know, we kind of hide the stairwells in all these buildings. If you go into office buildings downtown Toronto and the major cities, it's, it's tough sure. to even find the stairs. So it's amazing how, um, you know, I've got a few clients who are who are architects and, and kind of redesigning a lot of these buildings to make to make climbing the stairs even more uh, appealing and, and accessible is key. But definitely do a little homework, find out where the stairwell is, and, and get in there. And um, it's amazing how even just one trip up the stairs and building your way up to getting up those eight flights or whatever it might be is, as you mentioned, just a great way to to bang out the you know basically like right. a hit workout, but you're getting one one good set, right? Well, exactly, and I do it in the morning and uh, with. Gabala at all call it uh, Gabalum call it call that exercise snacking you know where you it might take you less than five minutes or a couple of minutes but do that a couple of times during the day get up and move around it really is beneficial for you yeah it's funny I get over here in London in the Marylebone station is a train station in, in London and there's I get some funny looks there's a staircase it's got to have maybe 120 150 steps and you know, take those two at a time all the way to the top. And, you know, everyone on the escalator sort of looks at you like, what's that person doing? Um, but again, a yeah, great opportunity to get in there and get the, get the exercise for the day. Right. And, and the problem I see too is, you know, when you're counseling patients, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And that's the, that's the challenge. You know, you can educate people all you want, but they have to inherently want to do it. And, I try to educate people as much as I can, but you have to realize they it's like quitting smoking. They know it's wrong. Um, they've been counseled by their physicians, by whomever, but until they make that you know, step in their own mind that they want to quit or they want to initiate an exercise program, it won't help. So, you know, it, it, won't, it won't happen, I should say. Um, so that's a tough situation. You, you you can provide the tools, but they have to provide the execution. Yeah, it's very well said. And um, you know, I recently had Dr. Peter Jensen on, uh, sports psychologist, and you know, he always talks about yeah that idea of logic. You know, as humans, we sort of um, we don't make as many decisions based on logic as we'd like to think. Because as you mentioned, people wouldn't smoke or they wouldn't do these behaviors. And you know, he always talks about that emotional side and the imagery side being a, a real language and to try to connect people with that. And so I think. As you mentioned, once people are ready, it, it helps. But if we can if we can tap into some of the emotional aspects that get them motivated, um, that's a big that's a big one for Dr. Jensen to help uh, create some change. So for folks listening in, uh, you can definitely check out that um, episode as well. He's got a lot of great uh, great insights on that uh, that side of things. That sounds good. I, one thing I want to mention too, Mark, because um, I'm trained in advanced cardiac life support, which is one step above you know CPR. We can administer medications and um, there's a protocol we follow, but I think everybody in general, if they can, you wanna you want to um, get trained in CPR. It's really easy. Um, it's nothing scientific, and you can save somebody's life. You know, uh, while you're waiting for EMS to come, as long as you're pumping on their chest, you're perfusing their brain and their coronary arteries and their heart, and that can save somebody. Absolutely, hundred percent. It's a uh... Great, great suggestion there, Tony. And you know, definitely want to respect your time here. So before we wrap up, last uh, couple questions for you. Sure. Um, one of them's on the evolution of, of research in the area of the athlete heart and sudden cardiac death. Um, where do you think we might be in the next five or ten years in terms of you know whether it's diagnostics or some type of advancement? Well, I think um, you know they're looking at doing more genetic testing. Um, I think for sure if you have somebody. Uh, a family member that has um, a history of cardiomyopathy that, you know, more genetic testing is going to be available. That's one, I think, area that people are going to look at. Fantastic. And to round things out here, Tony, you know, from 30,000 feet, if folks are listening in and 
potentially struggling with being you know overweight or, or know that they've got high blood pressure or some of the other risk factors that we talked about you know what's a, a simple tip that you can give to, to help uh, get people started in the right direction well I guess you know a simple tip would be would be you know initiate the program and if you know I always say you know I can I can work out on my own without um, anybody else and that's you know, just years and years of doing it, but maybe get a, a friend to um, work out with you or uh, sign up for a gym. It, it holds you accountable, uh, and that way you can establish a habit, a habit, and then that can turn into a lifestyle, like it is for me and probably you. And it can you can remain that way for the rest of your life. And I don't know the psychological studies, but I think. What I tell people is, okay, you wouldn't miss work. Put in your daytime or your calendar that you're going to work out, let's say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one day of the weekend. And you're not going to miss it unless you're, you know, you're ill. And once you establish that pattern, over time it becomes a habit. And then over years it's your lifestyle. And you're going to reap the benefits from that. You're going to be, you know, you're going to lower your blood pressure. You're going to lose some weight. If you're a diabetic, you, you could reverse the process and maybe get off the medications. And again, it's a matter of execution. Yeah, it's a great advice. And, you know, as you mentioned, once you start turning this into a habit, it just requires a heck of a lot less inspiration and a heck of a lot less motivation to get yourself to do it. It just becomes automated. and, and Right, you know, it becomes you part of your daily, daily lifestyle. And if you don't do it, I mean, I, I always call it a positive addiction, um, meaning that, you know, when you, let's say I haven't worked out for three or four days, like I, I feel the difference. Now, it's a bad addiction when you, let's say, have a, a acute injury and you, and you keep exercising through it. That's the wrong mentality. You want to obviously rest and recover and um, try not to um, blow through those injuries. Terrific, Tony. Well, listen, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your great work? I'm actually on the uh, on Twitter. Um, started on that a couple of years ago. My, my following is rapidly getting, you know, increasing. My Twitter handle is um, at F-I-T-M-S-L-A-X. Uh, if they want to uh, log in and look at my Twitter feed. I usually 